we're already at Parshas Vayechi, the 12th Parsha, the final Parsha in the book of Genesis, how Genesis flew by. What a joy. What a privilege it is that we get to study the weekly Parsha together each week. And we're reading this week, Parshas Vayechi. Vayechi, and he lived. Who lived? Jacob lived. Jacob lived in the land of Egypt for 17 years, and then, of course, he passes. Now, it is ironic, the title of the Parsha talks about the life of of Jacob, and Jacob lived, Vayechi Akrov, and Jacob lived, but the whole Parsha, the content of the Parsha, is talking about Jacob's passing. So it starts off where he summons Joseph and says, don't bury me in Egypt, Bring me to land of Canaan, bury me in the cave of the patriarchs. And then he does the blessing for Joseph before he passes. And then he does the blessing for Joseph's sons before he passes. And he switches his hands, of course. And then he gathers all his children, chapter 49, and blesses all of his children. He intended to reveal what's going to happen to them in the end of days, but that was forgotten. And he pivoted to saying other things and he blesses all his sons. And of course, the first three to Reuven, to Shimon, to Levi, they sound more like a curse. But the rest of them, it's, you know, positive unequivocally. And he concludes his blessings and Jacob passes. And then you transition to the mourning phase and the embalming phase and the burial procession and the interring of Jacob in the cave of the patriarchs. And then we have the aftermath of the death of Jacob, which is the brothers, you know, trying to appease Joseph and the death of Joseph and the promise that God will save us from Egypt and bring us back and the Parsha and indeed the book end. But I find it ironic that the title of the Parsha doesn't really match its content. There's a bit of a bait and switch here. We're told about the life of Jacob and then we read all about the death and the passing of Jacob. The Parsha, as they say, buried the lead, quite literally. And why it does that is an interesting question that we will yet discuss. But today, I want to focus on a couple of verses that will change your life. Could you believe it? There are verses in the Torah that will change your life. Now, the truth is, we could say that about almost any verse in the Torah. If it's a verse in the Torah, it comes from the Almighty. It comes from the source of the highest wisdom. Of course, it could change your life. But this one, it's very overt how it changes your life. And that's the blessing of Shimon and Levi. It's three verses. Chapter 49, verse 5, 6, and 7. And it begins like this. Shimon Velevi Achim. Shimon and Levi are brothers. Clay Hamas Mechorosayim. Their tools, their weapons are stolen. And then it tells us, in their design, may my soul not enter with their congregation. Do not unite. Oh, my honor, for in their rage, they killed a man, and in their wish, they hamstrung an ox. Accursed is their rage, for it is mighty, and their wrath, for it is harsh. I will divide them in Jacob, and I will disperse them in Israel. These are the three verses that Jacob conveys to his two sons, Shimon and Levi. Now, it's interesting that all the sons get individualized treatment. The only blessing that combines two of the brothers is the blessing to Shimon and Levi. Even Yisachar and Zvun, who traditionally are lumped together because they have an agreement, half and half, half of the business prophets of Zvulun go to Yisachar, half of the spiritual prophets of the Torah of Yisachar go to Zvulun. They're always lumped together, but here they're blessed separately. But Shimon and Levi, the two brothers, it's lumped into one blessing. Why? And the answer is obvious, I think. Because their blessing is specifically about their relationship as brothers. Shimon Velevi Achim, they're two brothers. They are motivated by brotherhood and kinship. And that is what Jacob wanted them to know. Your brothers with stolen craft. Now, what does this mean? Let's read Rashi here and see how he unpacks the beginning of the blessing of Shimon and Levi. Shimon and Levi Achim. Shimon and Levi are brothers. Where is their brotherhood manifested? 
Be'etza Achas al Shem va'al Yosef. They were a tag team and they worked together against Shechem. Shechem, of course, is the one who kidnapped Dina in Parshas Vayishlach, and the brothers perpetrated the conspiracy, go circumcise yourself, day three they came and slew the whole city. And who did that? The two brothers mentioned here, Shimon and Levi. And in the attempted murder of Joseph, who was behind that conspiracy? It was the same two brothers, Shimon and Levi. So, of course, in the episode of Shechem, we read chapter 34, verse 25. On the third day, when the people of the city of Shechem are in pain because of their circumcision, Vayikhu Shnei Bnei Yaakov, and the two sons of Jacob took, who were these two sons? Shimon and Levi, Achei Dina. Shimon and Levi, the brothers of Dina, they took their swords, and they plundered the city, they destroyed the city, and they slew Every man. These two brothers, Shimon and Levi, perpetrated the slaughter of the city of Shechem. Okay, well, what about Joseph? How do we know that Shimon and Levi are responsible for the sale and the attempted murder of Joseph? So Rashi tells us that in Parshas Vayeshev, when Joseph was approaching the brothers, Vayomru ish el one man said to his brother, and again, here it's not identified who is speaking. Let's go kill this dreamer. So Rashi does some math here. Who are these two people? If you say it's Ruvain or Judah, can't be, because they didn't want to kill him. You can't say it's the four sons of the maidservants, Dan, Naphtali, Gad, and Asher, because they were quite friendly with Joseph. And it doesn't make sense that they would propose killing him. The only two people left are Zevulon and Yisachar. And they would never propose something ahead of their older brothers. It must be that we're talking about Shimon and Levi. That's the math that Rashi does. It must be that the ones who tried to kill Joseph, that was these two brothers, Shimon and Levi. So Rashi is introducing us to this idea that Shimon and Levi are a team. They're operating together. They're a band of brothers. And that's why they're lumped together, because these two brothers are behaving in a problematic way. Now, it's interesting that we have two deeds here of Shimon and Levi as brothers, the murder of the city of Shechem and the attempted murder of Joseph. And these were things that they did as brothers, but it wasn't just the two deeds that were done as brothers. If you think about what motivated those deeds, it was also because of brotherhood. Why did Shimon Levi destroy the city of Shechem? Well, they tell us because this city violated our sister Dina. They were incensed at what Shechem, the person, did to Dina and how the residents of, of Shechem, the city, they tolerated it. You mess with our family, you're dead. And this is all hinted to in, in, in the scripture, chapter 34, when it talks about the whole episode of Dina, when they make the plan and they have the faux agreement, you circumcise, you can marry Dina, it says, it hints at, it kind of foreshadows the fact that Shimon and Levi, they were still bothered by the fact that Dina was violated, was assaulted. Verse 13, in verse 27, after the destruction of the city, they plundered the city, that violated their sister. And then when Jacob says, what do you do? They justify their behavior. Are you going to allow our sister to be treated like a harlot? Shimon Levi had this strong sense of brotherhood and kinship. And when someone in their family was slighted or was taken advantage of, that was completely unconscionable and intolerable. And it had to be stamped out. And that's why, because of these motivations of brotherhood, that's why they destroyed the whole city of Shechem. Similarly with Joseph. Why did Shimon Levi want to kill Joseph? Because they felt he was causing rifts in the family. 
He was snitching to Jacob and telling Jacob about all the terrible things that the brothers were doing. He was trying to destroy the family. And he was, in their eyes, the problematic child, the force that threatened to upend and destroy the family, and he had to be stopped. So we see that Shimon and Levi are brothers in more ways than one, not just that they work together as brothers, but the motivation behind Shimon and Levi's two crimes was, in fact, brotherhood. And now, on Jacob's deathbed, he reveals to them what was underlying their behavior. There's a certain pattern in the various mistakes that you made over your lifetime. Both of those crimes stemmed from the same root, that fierce feelings of brotherhood, those strong feelings of kinship, that feeling of Shimon the Levi Achim, Shimon Levi, your brothers, and you operate like brothers. Now Jacob continues, Clay Hamas Mechoraseim, their craft is stolen. What does that mean? Explains Rashi. This craft of murder, it is stolen. You stole it from Esav. This craft that you're deploying in the episode of Shem, when you destroyed the whole city, and in the attempted murder of Joseph, that you got from Esav. It was his, and you stole it from him. This is an astounding Rashi. You read it, it kind of blows your mind. He's telling them that the tools that you used were stolen. The craft that you used was stolen. It was stolen from who? From Esav. In both crimes, that of Shechem and that of Joseph, your solution to the infringement upon the brotherhood was both murder. And that tool, the craft of murder, does not come from me. It was stolen from Esav. So just this Rashi gives us some amazing takeaways. Whenever there is something that happens, whenever there is a deed that's done, there are always two forces at play. There's there's the goal, the objective. What's motivating this behavior? And then there's the method. There's the craft. There are the tools to try to achieve that objective. There's what you want, the ends, and then there's the means. There's what you're interested in, and then the vehicle that you use to get it. The goal was protecting the family. Brotherhood. Kinship. Dina is our sister. We're not going to tolerate a violation of our sister. She's a princess. And we are not okay with some ruffian, some degenerate lowlife assaulting her. That was the motivation. And that is actually very good. To have a tightly knit family unit is amazing. But what they do about it? The craft, the means, the vehicle, the tools, the methods, that was all from Esav. The tools that you used to implement your desire, your objective, those were stolen from Esav. This is an incredible diagnosis of what was happening beneath the surface in Shimon and Levi and their blunders. Same thing with Joseph. They were very bothered by Joseph's behavior. He's encroaching upon the sacrosanct family cohesion, family unity and harmony. That was the motivation. That was the objective. To restore and maintain the sacred family unity. And that is a very noble goal. That is a very righteous goal. But the means, the ways that they tried to deal with it, that was stolen from Asaph. So first of all, this is an incredibly valuable framework for dissecting behavior. A crime could have some good motivations. There's the old saying that the path to hell, you've heard this one, right? The path to hell is paved with good intentions. Intentions alone are insufficient. 
The means and the tools must also be righteous, must also stem from Jacob. One thing, one part, one component of your behavior was good. It came from Jacob, the love of brotherhood, the unity. That's something which is completely good. But the tools that you got from Esav, that was stolen. So that's insight number one, that we could break down every behavior into what's motivating it and how it was executed. But there's a second amazing insight over here in this Rashi. There's this idea called stolen craft. You could steal someone else's craft. There's a craft, a modus operandi that belongs to someone else, and you could steal it. The brothers, they took a craft of Asaf and they stole it. They appropriated the qualities or the, the methodologies of Asaf. Now, when did they do this? How did they do this? If you think about it, how much time did Shimon and Levi actually spend with Uncle Asav? So we know they met, actually, we know for sure they met twice, but at this point they've met only once for sure. Parashas Vayishlach, Jacob is coming back from Laban to Isaac with his whole family. He discovers that Asav is coming with 400 men and the whole family meets Esav. Jacob himself met Esav only one more time over the course of the next 50 years of his life. When Jacob met his twin brother and his 400 comrades, they were both 97 years old. Jacob died 50 years later, and he met Esav only one more time in the interim. And that was at the burial of Isaac. Did Shimon and Levi attend that funeral? We don't know the answer to that question. At least I don't know the answer to that question. But the maximum amount of times that Shimon and Levi met Esav, a maximum of twice. I would imagine that, if I had to bet, Shimon and Levi did not attend Isaac's funeral and they only met Uncle Esav once. Now, in our Parsha, we're going to have the burial of Jacob, and we know that Esau was still alive, and he tried to block the funeral from happening, and we know that Shimlevi, subsequently, after this blessing, they met Esau again. But beforehand, certainly before the episode of Shem and Dina and Joseph, they met Esau only once. And how much time did they spend together? You would imagine it was very little time. Maybe a few hours. But in that span of time, it was long enough for them to steal something from Esav. The impression that Esav gave over with his band of 400 warriors in military regalia, loaded with weapons, girded with weapons, ready for a fight, that made a strong impression on Shimon and Levi. And it was long enough for them to adopt the craft of Esav. Some of Esav's aggression and violence was absorbed into Shimon and Levi. And now, decades later, Jacob is rebuking them. He said, in that short interaction, that was long enough for you to pick up the craft of Esav and to act with the tools of Esav. The great Rabbi Rucham has an amazing story on this Rashi. He says he was once speaking to someone and the person's mannerisms and method of, of speech and idiosyncrasies reminded him of someone else. And he didn't know if those two people actually knew each other. So he asked him, do you know such and such person? He said, yeah, we're, we're good pals. And he said... As a result of this story, it's so easy for people to pick up and adopt the habits, the traits, the mannerisms of other people. People are incredibly 
impressionable and malleable and pliable. And it's so incredibly easy for people to adopt the craft of others and begin to mimic them, to imitate them. It's a scary thought. Shimon Levi spent a couple of hours at most with Esav and their entire life, or at least up to this point where Jacob is rebuking them, admonishing them on his deathbed, they have absorbed and internalized and assimilated the tools and the craft of Esav because of their one interaction. It's a powerful thought. It's an incredibly scary thought. I think, you know, as our society becomes more and more integrated, the contrarians are rarer and rarer. And I think this is the reason why. Most people get sucked up into the monoculture. And culture, of course, means the culture itself, but also, you know, people's speech and ideals and priorities and values and and principles. Most people are operating solely with stolen craft. And what makes a contrarian unique, perhaps, is that they do the most contrarian thing. That they... Unlike the vast majority of mankind, they actually think for themselves and they exercise their individuality. Our society, of course, it preaches individual expression, but I suspect that almost everyone in almost every way is operating with stolen craft. If Shimon Levi, they only spent a couple of hours with Esav, but that was enough to get them to imitate and to mimic him and to adopt and steal his craft, how susceptible are we to being completely overtaken by the culture of others? People are incredibly impressionable. Everyone is copying everyone else. Everyone's opinions were assigned to them by others. Everyone is indoctrinated. In fact, we'd even say that the mark of a special person is someone who can be around others and maintain their individuality. We have Rebecca, the second verse of Parshas Toldos. It tells us her pedigree. She was Bas Basul, Dor Basul, from Padana Ram, the sister of Laban. Ask Srasha, we know all of this. Why is it telling us the pedigree and the backstory of Rebecca again? Says Rashi, amazing thing. Lehagid Shvacha, to tell us the praise of Rebecca. Shahisabas Russia. She was the daughter of a Russia. She was the daughter of a wicked person, Basul. And she was the sister of a Russia, the sister of Laban. And her land, her town, was completely replete with wicked people. The low Lamdabimasem, and she did not learn, she did not mimic and copy their deeds. She's the exception. Rebecca is the outlier. Everyone else is just copying, copying dad, copying brothers. Copying the kids at school, copying the neighbors. Everyone's copying everyone. And this is not a new problem. This is a problem that went back decades, centuries, and millennia. This is a problem as old as mankind. It's only the giants who can completely insulate themselves from negative influences of other people. So that's the second verse of Parshas Toldos. The second verse of Parshas Vayishlach tells us the same thing about Jacob. Jacob sends a message to his brother. Im love on Garti, I live with Laban, says Rashi. He's hinting to him, I lived with Laban, but I observed all 613 mitzvos. Velo lamadati ma'asav ha'ra'im. I did not learn from his bad deeds. Everyone's impressionable. It takes a giant like Jacob, like Rebecca, to completely insulate themselves from other people and to not absorb anything, to not adopt any of their craft. Even the sons of Jacob, Shimon and Levi, are susceptible. I think if you just learned this, it's kind of a terrifying idea. I always say, get off the social media, stop watching so much television. This, I think, is the primary reason why. The presence and the influence of other people and of other things can be very influential. 
can penetrate. When you watch television, you peruse social media, it can be destructive because you're absorbing everything. And those things that you absorb, you're adopting as well. And that's happening all the time. That is the condition of mankind. And when you willingly subject yourself to these media, you're outsourcing the most important aspects of your lives to others. Perhaps we could even say, this is why Torah is so valuable. What's Torah? Well, it's the Almighty's wisdom. By you exposing yourself to Torah, you're allowing God via his Torah to mold you. He's given you the most just and moral and logical and righteous and upstanding ideals and beliefs. The study of Torah is a request to ask God, God, I want your craft. I don't want the craft of other people. You mold me. You guide me. You show me how to live. Everyone is absorbing messages all the time. And you have to be very wise to choose which messages to absorb, which crafts to adopt. This is the first verse of the blessing of Shimon Levi. A total masterclass. An amazing verse. Shimon Levi Achim. Shimon and Levi are brothers. They have this amazing quality. They have brotherhood. They have kinship. They have responsibility for each other. In fact, actually last week's Parsha, there's a quick verse. This is in 46.10. It's enumerating the descendants of Jacob that went down to Egypt. And it tells us the sons of Shimon. Yemuel, Yamin, Ohad, Yachin, Tzohar. And then the final son is Vishaul ben Haknanis. Shaul, the son of the Canaanite woman. Who is this Canaanite woman that Shimon married and bore Shaul to him? So Rashi says something absolutely fascinating. If you had to guess, if you never saw this Rashi, you had to guess, you would give a hundred guesses before you guess what Rashi actually says. Who is this woman that Shimon married? Says Rashi, this woman is none other than Dina, his sister. And she is called a Canaanite because of her relationship with a Canaanite man, namely Shem. And all the commentators are bothered, well, how did Shimon marry his sister? But let's put the question off to the side we talked about it in previous years. Rashi explains to us how this union happened. After the brothers killed Shem, they went to rescue Dina. And she didn't want to leave. She felt violated and she was embarrassed and she said, no one will want me. No one will ever marry me. She was depressed and not interested of getting out of her depression. So Shimon said, I will marry you. And indeed, they married. And again, how they married and how that's not a problem of consanguinity. Nice SAT word there. How is that a problem is a subject that all the commentators talk about. But Shimon actually married her, and that is the union that bore Shaul, Shaul, Saul, ben Aknanis. What does this show us? This shows us the tremendous fraternal responsibility that Shimon had. No one wanted to marry her. Shimon says, I'll do it. This is an incredible quality of brotherhood, and it's in fact beautiful. That's the Shimon Levi Achim. That's the Shimon Levi of brothers. But how was it implemented? It was implemented with the craft of Esav. The craft was stolen. The reason why you killed and murdered an entire city was because you were acting, implementing the tools of Esav. The reason why you sold and entertained Killing Joseph, all that is from the craft of Esav. You have brotherhood from the house of Jacob, and you have murder from the house of Esav. 
This is the first verse of the blessing of Shem and Levi. It's a life-changing verse. Continues Jacob. Bisodam al tavonavshi. In their design, may my soul not enter. What does that mean? Says Rashi. In the episode of Zimri, Parshas Balak at the end, there was an episode in a descendant of Shimon where he acted in the same fashion. He acted out of brotherhood using the tools, the craft of Esav. In that episode, don't attribute me. When it talks about this individual, Zimri ben Salu, it tells us that he comes from Shimon, but it does not tell us the last link that Shimon comes from Jacob. His behavior in that episode was exactly executing and implementing the tools of Esav, and therefore it does not come from me, and that episode should not be attributed to me. Similarly, in their congregation, do not unite my honor. That's a reference to a future event done by a descendant of Levi, namely the rebellion, the insurrection of Korach. Jacob's revealing, prophetically, that this toxic mix of brotherly love that comes from Jacob and stolen craft of murder that comes from Esau, it will appear yet again. It will reveal itself two more times. In both of these instances, and the commentaries, of course, elaborate exactly how this works, in both of these instances, these two criminals, Zimri and Korach, are going to once again act out of brotherhood, but using the tools of Esav, and therefore Jacob says, I want no part of it. It doesn't come from me. And therefore you say, Korach, Ben Yitzar, Ben Kohaz, Ben Levi. But you don't tell us that Levi is the son of Jacob because in that behavior, that was not executing the craft of Jacob. Their behavior was not from Jacob. It comes from the stolen craft of Esau. And finally, the final verse of the blessing of Shem and Levi are upon Kiyaz. Cursed is their rage. And finally we read, I will divide them in Jacob and I will disperse them in Israel. In this final verse, Jacob is giving his children pure gold. He is designing their life so they will have the good qualities, the good parts of their behavior without any of the bad parts. He's going to distribute them. Distribute them amongst the nation. What does that mean? Says Rashi. The poor people who have to go from house to house. The scribes who need to sell religious articles to the entire nation. The school teachers that are needed in every community. All those people come from the tribe of Shimon and the tribe of Shimon alone. And the reason why is because these people have to be everywhere. They have to be distributed throughout the nation. The tribe of Shimon won't be coalesced into one. They will be dispersed throughout the nation. Similarly, the tribe of Levi, well, they're the tribe of the clergy. And they get the tithes. And therefore, in every field... In the entire land, you have to have a a Levi that you give the tithes to. What Jacob is doing here is creating and designing a life for his two sons that will allow them to use their quality of brotherhood in an unadulteratedly good way. Shimon and Levi, you have a tremendously positive quality of kinship, of brotherhood. But there were some problems with it. First of all, the brother was a little bit too narrow. To Joseph, you showed hatred. Problem one with your brotherhood. Problem two is that the way you executed it, it was with stolen craft of Esau. I'm going to design your life, says Jacob, that you're going to keep the good and you're going to amplify the good and you're going to excise and remove, get rid of the bad. You have so much love in your heart. 
You are committed to this family more than anyone else. You are the right people to be involved with the masses, to always be interacting with the rest of your brethren in the nation. You're going to be traveling salesmen, traveling scribes, school teachers distributed throughout the land, clergymen, spiritual leaders, priests who are everywhere. You will be interacting with your brothers all the time. You will be people who are always around other people, other Jews. No desk jobs in a cubicle for you. No, you got to be around with the people. In that fashion, you will be exercising your good quality. You have so much love for others. Use that love for good. The only way that you can succeed at a job that demands a lot of interpersonal interaction is if you truly love other people. You're gregarious. You're ebullient. You're amiable. You're a friendly person. You care for other people. Levi, you're the family of the clergy. To be an effective teacher, an effective school teacher from the tribe of Shimon, an effective religious teacher from the tribe of Levi, to be an effective rabbi, an effective clergyman, you have to love people. You have to love your flock. To be engaged with others, to be someone who cares for others, to be someone who's involved with others, that can only be the product of someone who truly cares for other people. But I want you to be the brothers of all, not just your small insular family, the entire nation. I want you to expand your canopy to everyone. No exclusions. Take your good quality and run with it. Amplify it. Utilize it for good. And make sure that the implementation of these qualities will come only from me and not from my brother Asaph. Now, it's interesting that Levi is actually praised for rejecting his family. All the way into the Torah, when Moshe is giving his blessing to the entire nation, he says, Ule Levi Amar, to Levi, to Levi, he said, gives him the, the praise, various different praises, and he mentions, Ha'omer la'avivu receive the people who said to their parents, to the father, I don't see you. Who don't recognize their brother. Don't know their son. Rashi explains what this means. After the sin of the golden calf, Moshe, this is chapter 32 of the book of Exodus, Moshe makes a call to arms. Me, la Hashem, Eli. Who is to Hashem? Come join me. And the entire tribe of Levi came. And they said, we're with you. We will get rid of the perpetrators of this horrific crime of the golden calf. As people were told, take your swords and go murder, not murder, go execute all the perpetrators, even if they are related to you, your father, your mother, your brothers, your children. It doesn't matter. And they did it. And for that, they are praised. It seems to me that this is very much related to what Jacob told Levi. Levi took the message to heart. You have an immense quality, but it needs to be targeted better. It needs to be moderated a little bit. Moshe gives the call to arms, and Levi goes, and is willing to even execute his own family. This was not brotherhood above all. Their loyalty was now to God above family. Now that they have the proper delineation, the proper prioritization of their quality, their quality could be, in fact, unadulteratedly good. And they're not working with the craft of Asav. Now they've upgraded their craft to be the craft of Jacob, the craft of God. Shimon, you're a school teacher. There are no school teachers in the nation except from the tribe of Shimon. You have so much love. You have love for others. You have care and concern and brotherhood and kinship. You are someone who can effectively educate 
young peoples. Show that love to everyone. In every city, this will be a representative of Shimon utilizing the tremendous quality of Shimon Levi. Achim, Shimon Levi, you are brothers and you love each other and you love your family. This is who should be a school teacher, no one else. This blessing is a total masterclass. It's an amazing series of lessons. Number one, we have the diagnostic part of it. There are two forces at play. Shim of Alevi Achim, your brothers, with stolen craft from Esav. People are very impressionable. You have to be very careful of watching what you watch. Make sure you don't learn from Esav. Yes, mimic the good influences. That's a good thing. But be careful of absorbing and imbibing harmful influences. Once you know what composes your character, you have to find a way to shed the bad and to deepen and amplify and spread and proliferate the good. And once you do that, you will arrive at your perfection. Now let me ask you a question. Would this be something that you yourself will be interested in? Would you like to undergo a rigorous self-examination, a rigorous discovery process of who you are, of what makes up your character, of what are the things that you have that are qualities that need to be sharpened, honed, polished, improved? And what are the things that maybe you should divorce yourself of because they come from bad places, they come from ASAP, they come from elsewhere? That is the Musser Masterclass that is beginning January 3rd at 7.30 Central on TorchZoom.com. Now again, if you want the class materials, you have to register because we don't know where to send it to you. How am I going to know which email of all the billions of email addresses to send the class materials for the Musser Masterclass for the 10-week program beginning at 7.30 Central on January 3rd, Monday night? How, how do I know? Should I just randomly put in email addresses? I can't do that. Send me your email address and you'll have the class materials to work on the Musser Masterclass so you yourself could undergo the process that Jacob, or the service, if you will, that Jacob afforded to his sons, Shimon and Levi, the two brothers, with an immensely powerful and positive characteristic of love of family that had one flaw in it. It came, or the implementation of that came from Esau and he designed their life so they could have just the good and amplify that good without any of the bad. Muster Masterclass, January 3rd at 7.30. Okay, let's get to this week's exquisite insight. Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready for this? Let's begin. As we mentioned at the top, there is an interesting irony in our Parsha. The Parsha is titled Vayechi, and he lived, and Jacob lived. But of course, the whole Parsha is about Jacob dying. That's the whole storyline of the Parsha. Maybe it's even the sole storyline of the Parsha is the final illness and his deathbed wishes and his deathbed blessings and then the actual burial. And there is, of course, some parts at the end with, with Joseph's dying and, and the promise and the hope of salvation. But certainly the absolute lion's share of our Parsha is about the death of Jacob. Yet it's called, Vayechi Yaakov and Jacob lived. Moreover, if you read the first two verses of the Parsha, it flip-flops. How does it start? Vayechi Yaakov and Jacob lived in the land of Egypt for 17 years. And he was 147 years old. That is the first verse of our Parsha. And the second verse talks about someone else. The first verse begins, Vayichi Yaakov and Jacob lived. And the next verse is, Vayikrivu Yimei Yisrael Lamos. And the days of Israel came close to dying. And he calls Joseph. And he says, please make sure you don't bury me in Egypt. Bring me to the land of Canaan. Bury me, etc., etc. We know the story. The first verse talks about Jacob. In the second verse, he is called by his other name, his pseudonym, the second name that was given to him by God, Israel. What is happening over here? So listen to this, the exquisite insight from this week's Parsha podcast, from the final podcast 
on the book of Genesis in this year, 5782, listen closely. The Talmud tells us the book of Titus, page 5b, and I know I was, uh, I was criticized, wasn't criticized. Someone sent me an email and they said, when you say the source, you say it too fast. I'll say a little slower. The Talmud tells us in the book of Titus, page 5b, Yaakov Avinu Lo Meis. Jacob, our forefather, did not die. Jacob didn't die. The whole parish is about the death of Jacob. And the verse tells us, the Talmud tells us, Jacob did not die. What's going on over here? What does it mean he didn't die? Does it mean he's still alive? So, of course, the commentaries talk about it. It means that he didn't actually undergo death. He just transitioned into heaven. Most people die. Jacob didn't die. And he transitioned in a different way. That's the, I would say, the consensus way to understand what, what the Talmud's actually saying. But listen to this. The parish begins, Vayichi Yaakov and Jacob lived! And then it says, oh, and Israel got close to dying. What does it mean that Jacob had two names? God says, oh, let me add a name. Let's, let's go to, uh, let's go to the, uh, DMV and rename you, uh, Meta World Peace. Uh, that's a little bit of an oblique reference, but let's give you a different name. And now you have a different name, different identity. That's not what's happening over here. If God gives someone a different name, it means he gives them a different essence. Unlike Abraham, though, when Abraham was named Abraham, the essence of Abraham was was gotten rid of, was destroyed. You cannot call Abraham, Abraham. Whereas with Jacob, it wasn't the getting rid of one and the supplanting of that identity with a second identity. It was getting a second identity. Jacob has two identities, the identity of Jacob and the identity of Israel. What this means, explain the Kabbalists. Jacob had two souls. He had the soul of Jacob, and he had the soul of Israel. How does our parsha begin? What's the name of the parsha? Vayechi Yaakov, and Jacob lived. Says the Talmud, Jacob lived and never died. The soul of Jacob was not subject to death at all. The second verse talks about Jacob's impending death. Every single time it talks about the death of Jacob, it attributes him with the second name, the second identity, the second soul, Vayikravu Yimei Yisrael, Ramos, and Israel approached his demise. What an amazing idea, but we're not done yet. There's another idea here. Equally exquisite, in my opinion. And this is a callback to something we spoke about a few weeks ago. We talked about the Luz bone, you remember that? The part of the bone, the bone part of the spine that doesn't die. The Midrash says that Jacob didn't die. Yet we find that a lot of other great Southern Game Rights people did die. So why did Jacob not die, whereas other righteous people did die? So they say this amazing idea. Every single soul is part of the soul of Adam. There's only one soul. But that soul was the soul of Adam before his sin. It got divided up. It got divided up into three. It was like Jacob, into 12, into 70, into... 600,000. A very advanced Kabbalistic idea. Each one of our individual souls is a component, a spark, an aspect, an element of the soul of Adam. And depending upon where in Adam the soul emanates from, our soul, that determines what kind of soul we have, and what kind of mission we have. And we know the body and the soul themselves are mirror images of each other. And therefore, if there is a head in the body, there's got to be a head in the soul. If there's a right hand and a left hand, there's got to be a right hand and a left hand in the soul. If there are 613 parts of the body, there have got to be 613 parts of the soul. These are ideas that are well-founded and established and accepted. If there is a loose bone in the body, if there's a part of the body that never dies... There's got to be part of the soul that never dies as well. 
Jacob is always associated with Luz. It's not just the place where he lived. Every time the word Luz appears in the Torah, it's identified with Jacob. Jacob comes from the Luz part of Adam. And that tiny little part of Adam, and the souls that are associated with that part of Adam, they don't die. And that's why Jacob, in fact, did not die. Of course, these are very advanced ideas. And what the lessons are and what it means for us, we don't know, but that's not what I promised. I promised you an exquisite insight. Not an exquisite insight with practical, applicable lessons. No, no, no. It's just an insight. It's an idea. It's exquisite, I think, by any definition of the word. And I hope you enjoyed. And I thank you so much for listening. And I thank you for your patience. And I thank you for your friendship and your support throughout the book of Genesis. And please, God, I wish you to have an amazing rest of your day, a fantastic and splendid and wonderful rest of your week, and an incredible and exquisite and amazing Shabbos upcoming. And please, God, with hope of the mighty, we will talk again next week when we begin the book of Exodus with the help of the Almighty in good health, in sound health, in great spirits, in happiness and joy and camaraderie and brotherhood together. Until then, we address is Rabbi Walby at gmail.com.